Uh, welcome. My name is Pastor Leewood. I'm the discipleship pastor here. And so every Wednesday night uh, at 630 is whenever we start our time in here. We, over the summer, were walking through a series of the attributes of God, and before that, we were in 1 John, looking verse by verse in 1 John. And so now, we are back into biblical content, and we're going verse by verse with three minor prophets, with Jonah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. That's what the next 15 weeks or so we're going to be, uh, minus the one week for Thanksgiving. Other than that, we're going to be doing this. And so, if you did not... There's a book of notes back there. If you didn't grab one, make sure you grab one of these guys. Um, and you can see there on the inside cover why we are hitting these three books. I'm going to talk about that here in a bit. Um, and you can also see the schedule of what verses we're covering when. So if you are so inclined to read ahead, this would be a great way for you to do that. Um, this is something that I feel is incredibly useful. You can keep all your notes in one spot. If you use a notebook, hey, rock on. Use that instead. Like, you don't have to grab this if you don't want to. We just want to make it available for us. Yeah? All right, so here's what's going to happen. Tonight is going to be a little more of me kind of lecturing um, whenever we're working through our material, but there is going to be places for discussion. And I will tell you, if I don't get discussion, I am going to start calling on people, right, by name. Right, Mary-Kate? She said yes, so there's proof right there, right? So that's what's going to happen. And I think for all of us, this is going to be best done if we get some interaction uh, in those appropriate places, yeah? Are you all cool? You all ready to give me go with this? Give me north-south? All right, where are we heading tonight, if my notes will change for me? Nope. Okay, what I want to do is I want to give you the schedule of what we are covering tonight. We are going to talk about why Jonah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. We're going to preview the whole series. And then I want to talk through this section as a whole. And we're going to do that by giving you a main idea that I want you to write down in your notebook. We're going to talk about who Jonah the man is. We're going to talk about Jonah's world that he inhabited. And then we're actually going to get to the text of verses 1 through 3 and then 4 through 6, have some final thoughts, and then we'll have some discussion questions there at the end, right? If we have time to really dive into the discussion questions, great. If not, I'm going to put them up there, write them down, think about it, right? That's how we're going to do it. So this is where we're heading. And so before I actually read and do all that stuff, I want to tell us why we are actually looking at Jonah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. Let me ask you this. Of those three, those three books, I promise you, they're all books of the Bible, which one are you most familiar with? Jonah, all right? How many of you feel confident you could tell me something about Nahum? Okay. How many of you feel confident you could tell me something about Habakkuk? How about Kuk? Yeah, so we got one or two head nods. All right, so let me tell you why I want us to cover these three. Number one, I got two big reasons, but number one, we're going to cover a lot of Israel's history. And so we're picking up after the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom have split. So you got Israel in the north and Judah down in the south. But we're going to be covering a pretty big chunk of history. Whenever you're thinking about first and second kings, who are the two big prophets that we run into in those two books? See, y'all didn't know y'all going to get a test. Not Samuel, because Samuel is in Samuel. And then immediately after Samuel, you have First and Second Kings. What's the big prophet specifically in First Kings? Elijah. Elijah. Who's after Elijah? Elisha. Do you know who the next prophet is after Elisha? Jonah. In fact, Jonah is probably alive when Elisha is running around. How many of us have in our mind Elijah and Elisha were like centuries before all these other minor prophets? They're not. Like, they are contemporaries. Now, we don't know exactly when Jonah was born, but what we do know is that likely he is one of the first, if not the first, writing prophets, right? Elijah and Elisha didn't write down their stuff, most likely. Somebody else did. However, when you look at Jonah, there's a lot of detail that either he wrote it or he told it to somebody who immediately wrote it, because it's actually pretty well attested early on. Okay, so we're covering a big chunk of time because we're going all the way back to Elijah and Elisha, boom, Jonah right then. And then the second big thing that we're covering in this time is you go from Eli, or excuse me, uh, Jonah, who's talking about Nineveh, and then Nahum, who talks about the destruction of Nineveh. So you have like the salvation and the destruction of the same city. And then you have Habakkuk, which brings us all the way to basically the Babylonian exile, which makes him a contemporary of whom? 
Who was that? Jeremiah. And he's right before Daniel. So you see, that's a big chunk of history there that we're talking as well, right? So we're going all the way from the northern kingdom is still around to they're about to not be, all the way to the southern kingdom is about to be destroyed and exiled as well. Yeah? So that's the first big reason. We're covering a huge chunk of time. And the second main reason is for each individual book. They're giving us three things that are unique from all three. So here's the first of those three. Whenever we encounter Jonah, what we're actually running into is a really well-known prophet, which is what y'all said. You knew more about Jonah than Nahum or Habakkuk. But what I am telling you is, I don't think we actually know the lesson that we're supposed to learn from Jonah. How many of us have the idea in our mind that Jonah and the whale, and that's the story of Jonah? Most of us have encountered Jonah in children's books or if you're old enough, the flannel graph, or whatever it may be, right? Like, that's Jonah. And what I'm telling us is, no, I think there's a lot more to Jonah that is for us. And if that's true, then I want to give us something that we're incredibly familiar with, but now we need to understand what it was really about. So that's Jonah. And then in Nahum, we get what we kind of expect. We get that prophetic judgment that's being announced by these minor prophets. He's kind of like the angry dude that you have in your mind. I don't think that's exactly what's going on, but he kind of fits that bill. And so I want to give us some tools about how to handle reading a dude like that. Because if you understood, understood Nahum, now you can read Hosea or Obadiah or Jeremiah or Daniel, right? And then lastly, this is the last of the three, Habakkuk, you're going to run into a, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a completely unique book. Do you know who Habakkuk is prophesying to? Who his audience is? Anybody? Does anybody want to take a guess? No one. Nowhere in Habakkuk is he actually preaching or proclaiming a message to anyone. Now, what we know is from the recording of the book, he would take that content and then eventually go and preach. But in Habakkuk, do you know what it is for the first two chapters? And there's really only a couple, right? It's him having a conversation with God, and then there's like a formal prayer. That's it. So you're seeing like a radically unique book that's just tucked away right there in the middle of the Old Testament. So that's why we're hitting these three, because I think we're getting something from the timeline, and these three each individually offer something unique that's going to prepare us to be able to read all of the prophets, all the minor prophets, reading a big chunk of the Old Testament whenever you get to um, Elijah and Elisha, because Jonah reads a whole lot more like Elijah and what happens in 1 Kings and 2 Kings with Elisha way more than Jeremiah or Lamentations, okay? So I'm trying to give us a smattering of information there. Cool? All right, so that's the reason why. Questions, comments, concerns. How many of you have already had your mind blown that Jonah was right there with Elisha? Kind of crazy, right? But there we go. Okay, all right, here's what I want to do now. I want to give you the main idea, and then I'm going to read. Actually, we're going to read, and I'm going to give you the main idea. I want you to write it down. We're going to return to it towards the end of the night, um, and then we're going to go from there. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Jonah chapter 1. We're going to pick it up in verse 1 all the way through verse 6. And by the way, we're talking about Jonah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. And if you need to go to the glossary, or not the glossary, the table of contents at the beginning of your book, your Bible, and figure out where that is, ain't no shame in that. As long as you get there, you'll be good to go. All right, if you're there, make eye contact with me. All right, you're there. All right, let's go to Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. I'm reading from the ESV, and this is what is recorded for us. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amadi, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, he went down into it, to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Are you picking up some repetition here? Verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. And then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. 
But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, O sleeper? What are you doing, guy? How are you sleeping? Arise, call out to your God, and perhaps that God will give us a thought and that we may not perish. Here's the main idea that I want us to see from this section. And you're going to see this kind of play out throughout the rest of Jonah, but here's the main idea for tonight specifically. Jonah's disobedience brought about disastrous results for not only himself, but also for others. And the same thing is true for us. Jonah's disobedience brought about disastrous results for himself and others, and we can say the same thing about us as well. Okay? And so even right now, you probably have in your mind what happens with Jonah and his disobedience, and he runs away, and there's a storm, and he gets thrown in the water, and there's this huge fish, right? And all of that's going to come to play. But I think this kind of summarizes what we need to know from these first six verses, all right? I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to dive into who Jonah the man is, and uh, you can keep recording down what you see up there. I'm going to pray for us. Father, we thank you for the fact that you have, in fact, recorded for us uh, this story of our brother Jonah, a man who has real obedience but also real flaws. God, I pray that as we are working through this text tonight that you would be honored by the way that we seek to understand what it is that you have written for our benefit and for our instruction, and that, God, that we would have uh, your help and your assistance through the Holy Spirit to make that happen. And as is my custom, I would ask for you to pray for me that the things I say would be beneficial, they would be accurate, and be clear, and that I would say nothing that's out of harmony with the gospel. If you would, just pray for me. Father, I have looked forward to this night for several months and been preparing and thinking through what it is that you would have us to learn, uh, not only just from these verses, but from Jonah as a whole and these minor prophets as a whole. God, I pray that as we are endeavoring to understand this content tonight, I pray that you would give me clarity of thought and I pray that you would give me understanding to be able to explain well. And God, I pray that you would uh, open up our hearts and our minds as we are listening in, in person here, if we're listening to this after the fact, watching online, God, I pray that you would be made much of during that time, that you would help us understand, and that uh, you would receive the glory from what we understand and learn and apply to our lives. Father, we love you and we need you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So that's our main idea. Jonah's disobedience brought about this disastrous result far more than he bargained for. And it wasn't just for him, it was for everyone else around him as well. We cool with that? Y'all got that written down? If you don't, you can catch it later, all right? Okay, so let us talk about Jonah the man. What do you know about Jonah that's not from the book Jonah? Does anybody know anything? Amy, what you got? He was what? He was buried when? In Nineveh, okay. That's what history would tell us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Did y'all know that he actually shows up in Israel's histories? He's in the Bible. <laughs> He's a dude that's running around. I want you to look at 2 Kings, or you can just write this down. 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 23 through 27. And so this is a section that's talking about King Jeroboam. Not the bad Jeroboam that kind of starts off the whole northern kingdom uh, with the split with Jeroboam in the north and Rehoboam in the south. Um, But this is another Jeroboam that we run into. But he is ruling and he's reigning, and there happens to be a prophet. And guess who that prophet is? Jonah. So I want to read for you. This is 2 Kings chapter 14, verses 23 through 27. I'm actually going to pick it up in verse 25. We're talking about Jeroboam. There's a war. This is what's going on. Verse 25 says this. He, Jeroboam, he restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant, Jonah, the son of Amadi. He is the prophet who was from Gath-Hefer, 
Don't worry about where that is. I'll tell you where it is here in a bit. He was from gath Hefer, And for the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, so he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. So what we see going on here is that Jonah shows up as a prophet in the northern kingdom. And he is from what we read as... Uh, I'm um, sorry, I missed my, missed my spot. He's from gath Hefer, right? If you don't know where that is, no big deal, because that's actually from Galilee. That's basically the Galilean region. Here is a very simple trivia question. Who is the only prophet that Jesus refers to himself as or compares himself to? Jonah. There are other people who talk about him being Elisha, but that was John the Baptist, or Elijah, sorry. But they compare him to that. But Jesus never compares himself to any of these other prophets, except one. And we're going to read that here in just a moment. Why? Partly because it fit the narrative that he was trying to convey, but also because he's from back home. He's from that region. So we know where Jonah was from. And not only that, here's the thing that I think we really need to see that I think will change how we view Jonah as a whole he had already experienced ministerial success in the northern kingdom after Elisha, right? So Elijah was one of these cat, cats who was really proclaiming against Ahab and his consorting with the Arameans, these guys who were further up north, and Elisha kept on doing some of that same stuff. Well, Jonah's right on his heels, and he had already been one of these prophets who proclaimed to King Jeroboam that, hey, you're going to expand the borders of Israel. Basically what had happened, I'm going to show you a map here in a second. The Arameans, these cats are what we call Syria, right? The Syrians had been fighting the Assyrians, and so all of their interest was divided, and so they sent all their armies up north because that's where the border was with Assyria. And what do you think Jeroboam did after he got this word from Jonah? Hey, go restore the border. And so he did. Jonah was the guy that got to tell the king, hey, the Lord's actually working here. Go be obedient. He had already experienced ministerial success. And then he's called to go to Nineveh. And that's what we read from here on. Okay? Does that make sense? So this is really important because a lot of people will say that, well, man, there's some crazy stuff in Jonah. Right? What's the crazy stuff that you know of? There's one big one in chapter 2. There's a big old fish, right? We call it a whale, but the word is for fish, right? So like some grouper swallowed this dude up or something? Like, I, who, I mean, that's, that's wild, right? What are some other crazy things that happen in Jonah? There it is. In chapter 4, he's mad. He's ready to go up on the hill and die, and he's mad about it, and God gives him some shade. And he's thankful for a moment, and then God kills his shade by sending a worm, and he's mad again. Like, all of this is just steeped in supernatural stuff. And so a lot of people will say, yeah, but Jonah, like, he wasn't even a real guy. None of that stuff really happened. You know how I know that Jonah was real and that there's good reason to believe that? Jesus assumed he was real. Right? Jesus, the only prophet he vocalized that he was being compared to was Jonah. And don't you think it would really cheapen what Jesus would say if he compared himself to someone that, like, didn't exist? I want to read for you. This is Matthew chapter 12, verses 40 and 41. Matthew 12, 40 and 41. There's some folks demanding some signs from Jesus. Hey, man, you say who you say you are? Prove it. And so this is what Jesus says in Matthew 12, 40 and 41. He says, the only sign you're going to be given is the sign of Jonah. He says, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. I'm going to compare myself to Jonah, but fellas, don't get it twisted. I am not Jonah. He went down in the fish for three days. I'm going to go on the earth, and I'm going to be dead for three days. And here's my point. If Jonah was mythical or legendary, don't you think that would cheapen Jesus' claims about what would happen with his death and resurrection? Yeah? So it stands to reason that whenever Jesus says, 
No, the sign that you're going to get is the sign that Jonah already gave you. Three days down in the fish, three days in the earth, and then coming right back. Are you tracking with that? So this is who Jonah is. This is his experience so far. And I think the thing that we need to recognize is that Jesus thought he was real, and our own accounting of history declares that he is. Yeah? Y'all cool with that? All right, this is all the introductory stuff that we're going to do. We've got one more little bit. All right, here's the deal. Um, I think the application, if you want to, how do you apply this stuff? Jonah was a real man who had real obedience had real disobedience, and frankly, there are real lessons that we need to learn from him. Yeah? Track him with that? He's a real man, real obedience, real disobedience, and there's some real lessons we need to learn. Cool? All right, so let's talk about the world that Jonah inhabited. So this is about 780-ish B.C., um, so this is after Elijah and Elisha and them boys are off the scene. So I'm just going to point right up here. All right, so you've got Israel and Judah. you got the two nations that are split right there. And then you have Samaria, which is the capital of Israel. And then right down here, you have Joppa, okay? I want you to notice where Joppa is in relation to Samaria. It's southwest of there. You've got Syria, which is the Arameans, which are just north of Israel. Remember, they were fighting the Assyrians, which is this big green blob all the way around here. This is the Assyrian Empire. They were fighting these cats up near Hamath. And so uh, the Arameans put all their armies up north, and that's how Jeroboam took back the land, right? Tracking with that? So the other places that we know of are Nineveh. This is where Jonah is supposed to go. Take note of where Nineveh is in relation to Samaria. It is northwest. Come now. You see what I'm saying? He's supposed to go northwest. In which direction does he go? Southeast. Okay. He is going to this place called Tarshish. Tarshish, we're going to talk about here in just a bit, is probably Spain. It's probably some area in Spain, all right? We're going to catch a boat from Joppa, and there's going to be this place that's all over. You've got Africa that kind of runs over here. You've got Turkey, Greece, Rome kind of sits over here, and then Spain is like over on this edge. Like that's how far Tarshish is, okay? You're kind of putting all this map in your head. Just hold on to it for one more second. Other places that you might want to know, Babylon's down here for the Babylonian kingdom. They are kind of part of Assyria at this point. They eventually revolt. And then you got the Medes and Elam. That's Medes and Persia, Ekbaktana and Susa. Those are places you hear about in Nehemiah, Ezra, and Esther, right? There's all sorts of stuff that happens in that area. We cool with that? So now that you have that oriented in your mind, here's what we're going to do with it. We're going to go now to Jonah Chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we're going to read it again, and we're going to put some of that to good use. All right. This is what Jonah 1, 1 through 3 says. Again, I want you to listen for repetition. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amadi, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil or their disaster, their ruin, has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee for two Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. You tell me, what things did you hear repeated there that might be important for us to take note of? What repetition did you notice? He's running away from God. What does your translation say? He's not just running away. There's a specific term there. You'll see it in verse 1 and in verse 3. I'm sorry, verse 2 and verse 3. He's going down. Yep, that's good. And he's fleeing from what specifically? The presence of the Lord. Okay, good. What other repetition did you see? So Brendan noted the going down. And if you read verse 1, I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 2, and then later in verse 6, you'll see another one that will become pretty clear here in a moment. Anything else stick out to you? Where's he going? Tarshish. Right? Like, he keeps saying it. Like, there's no accident here. He knows what he's doing. He's intentional about every bit of this. Yeah? Cool? All right, so here's the first thing. Here's one of those repetitions that we need to see. Jonah is told to arise, verse 1 and verse 6. The Lord says, arise, go to Nineveh, and call out against it. Yeah? And then later in verse 6, the captain comes down there and kicks his cot. He's like, hey, man, what are you doing to sleep? Get up. Arise, 
Call out to your God. Yeah. But instead of Jonah arising, what does he do? He keeps going down. Down. He descends. He goes down to Joppa. He finds a boat. He goes down into it. A little bit later in chapter 2, verse 6, where's he going down to? He's in the fish. He's going to the bottom of the, the water. Are you tracking with that? Like there's a clear indication here that this is not going well. And it's all intentional, yeah? And so here's the deal. Whenever God says arise, when that captain says arise, this is a demand for immediate action. In one case, we actually see Jonah take immediate action. What is the immediate action he takes in verse 3? He takes off, right? Dude bolts. That's not exactly what we were looking for. And then in verse 6, we'll see that in a bit. He's told to arise... And he kind of wipes the sleep out of his eyes, like, yeah, 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 I'm getting there. Yeah? So that's what I want you to see initially, is that this is all bad. And then here's the thing. Which direction was Joppa? Does anybody remember? From Samaria? South, southwest. Which way was Nineveh? Northeast, right? Joppa is the opposite direction of Nineveh. Not only that, like, he is trying to take a boat from Joppa to an even further place, right? This is not accidental. He's doing it on purpose, yes? You tracking with that? Immediate action. Arise. <laughs> Got it. I'm out. Go the wrong way. He should have gone north and then hung a right and gone over to Nineveh, but he didn't do that. He went straight southwest, yeah? And then where was he going? Where was he trying to catch a boat to? Tarshish. And I've already said this, Tarshish was probably somewhere in Spain. So most likely what was going on is that uh, Jonah was trying to catch a boat with some Phoenician cats. Anybody know who Phoen uh, the Phoenicians are? Anybody at all? I'm looking at you, Brennan, my history guy. What's the most famous Phoenician colony? Carthage. The Punic Wars. These cats who fought Rome. Hannibal. Ring a bell? Those are Phoenician cats. These dudes owned the Mediterranean. So they knew everything about the Mediterranean. They had colonies everywhere, and it stands to reason they were going to Tarshish. Like, they're going all the way to what is now today Spain, right? And that's important. Why is that important given what we know geographically? I mean, you saw me point my laser pointer all the way over here. Like, what is the significance of Tarshish then? It's on the other side of like what could feasibly be known at that point. It is as far away as he could get. Okay. Whenever we as Americans are talking about a real place that exists, but it's also like incredibly far away, it's going to take a huge amount of effort to get to. What is the name of that place that we reference? Does anybody have an idea? It starts with the letter T. Not Tarshish. Timbuktu. Timbuktu is a real place, right? But what do we mean when we say Timbuktu? Like, man, it's out there, dog. Like, it's so far away that, like, you can't even fathom what it's going to take to get there. Tarshish, just do a quick Google in the Bible. It shows up a lot of places. And it always shows up as this place that is so far away. In fact, it's a colloquial reference that it is so far away that it's somewhere that God is not. Whenever you see Tarshish being referenced in the Old Testament especially, it is normally referenced as, hey, there are these kings who are going to be coming in in the restoration of God's real kingdom. There's going to be these kings from the south, from Ethiopia. There's going to be these people that come from very distant lands, and they're going to come, and they're going to recognize that God is Lord. And they're using Tarshish as like, hey, even those folks recognize how great God is. But the point is, when a Hebrew references this, he's talking about a place that is somewhere that God is not. Because why is Jonah going to Tarshish? What's he trying to escape? He is fleeing from the presence of God. And if you're a Hebrew, where is that place? Timbuktu. Tarshish. Right? Are you tracking with that? All right, so that's what's going on in verses 1 through 3. So how are we actually supposed to apply this? Well, then let's just ask a couple of questions. 
it seems to me that Jonah, this is his rationale, he seems to think that since he can't escape God's call on his life, which we've already seen that he is called to be a prophet because he's already talked to Jeroboam, he's already experienced ministerial experience, er, success, right? He's already done the whole thing, and now he's being asked to go to Nineveh. He knows he can't escape God's call. What's the next best thing? I'll just get away from God altogether. Now, here's the problem. Whenever we look in chapter 2, I'm going to point it out when we get there, Jonah is intimately aware of many of the Psalms of David, including Psalm 139. So in Psalm 139, this is David saying, you are intimately aware with every detail of my life. You've knit me together in my mother's womb. If I ascend to the highest heavens, you're there. If I go to the bottom of the ocean, you're there. Hint, hint. Jonah knows these things. He knows he can't outrun God. He sure does seem to be trying, though. And it seems to me that that's his rationality. Even though he knows it's not going to work, Jonah knows that this is futile, but he still does it. So here's the real question. Why does he do it? For a man who had already experienced God's call, a man who had already experienced ministerial success, for a man that knew certainly about the graciousness and the kindness of God, why is he bolting now? You tell me. It's going to be hard. I like it. He doesn't want to see the repentance of Nineveh. If you go look in chapter 4, verse 2, you'll see that exact thing. This is the exact reason, God. This is why I didn't want to go. I knew you're gracious and they might repent. Okay? Distill that down for me, Gary. Why didn't he want to go to Nineveh then? Go ahead. He didn't like them. Rich? He didn't think God was going to hold them as accountable as he, Jonah, was holding them. Maybe Jonah knew a little bit better than God. Like, hey, man, these are the guys that are like, they're bad. I know about them. And in fact, they're proven to be bad in about 50, 60 years, because guess what? They destroy his hometown. Right? So far we have, it's going to be hard. I think we can also add, it's going to be a really long way. It's going to be a hard, like, trip to even get up there, right? He doesn't want them to experience it. He doesn't like them. He thinks they deserve something less than what uh, they should get, right? Or, I'm sorry, they deserve less than what God would possibly give them, right? They're not deserving. Any other reasons spring to your mind as to why Jonah wouldn't do this? Here's my point. Are those not also the same reasons why we're disobedient? It's going to be hard. You're supposed to love that person. Yeah, but I don't like them. Hey, you need to go serve this person. Yeah, but do you know what all they did? Tell me this is not the same reasons that we disobey. How many of us, of those of us who have trusted in Christ, would say you have experienced God's grace? How many of us, if we're really honest, would say, yeah, but that dude is too far gone. Like, I don't think he's ever going to experience God's grace. And if you're honest, raise your hand like me. So why did he do it? I think it's for every one of those reasons. I think this is really important for us. This is how we're going to apply it. I think for Jonah, he was looking for an out. But I think the point is, like, there is no out. God's call is real. It's effective. God's desire for repentance for these people that objectively don't deserve it was real and that he wanted them to experience that grace. And we see them repent. Jesus said, hey, man, the people of Nineveh, they're going to come and they're going to judge you Pharisees because they repented and you won't. Right? I think that for many of us, whenever we get outside of our routine or out of our comfort zone, then I think a lot of times we start to think that the the standard for us of obedience is now lessened. Well, I mean, school just began, and so I'm not sleeping well, and yeah, my kids are being wild, so it's okay that I, like, lost my temper with them. That was me yesterday, just so y'all know, right? That was my thing. 
well, I mean, I've got this work trip and I'm going to be out of town and like, it's just going to be, you know, it's going to be difficult. So I'm not going to be able to get to church. I'm not going to be able to read my Bible. I'm not going to be able to pray. I'm out of my routine. Like, it'll be okay because God understands. It's hard, right? And here's my point. I think what happens for us as Christians is once we get out of that comfort zone, let's put it in the circle of like evangelism. Like I think that we will gladly share the gospel with somebody we meet at church or somebody uh, knows that we're going to encounter them in the world, like we're going to work with somebody who goes to church. And so we're really comfortable with talking about God and Bible and the gospel and that type of stuff in those settings. But the instant we are not in that setting, we feel like the standards have relaxed a little bit. But objectively, has that happened? Has the standard of our conduct changed because we went to a different location? In fact, I would argue that being at work is not a place where there's less scrutiny. There should be more. Guys who go on, guys and girls who go on work trips and they fall into pornography or alcohol abuse during that time because no one else is going to find out, like you really think you're pulling one over on the old man? Like you really think that's what's happening because you went away? Like, that's exactly what Jonah's trying to do, guys. That's the same thing. I got, I got a thing out of town, so, like, I, I'm excused. No, no. It don't matter how you got there. The standard hadn't changed. That's why I think this is so important for us, and I think this is the reason why we miss Jonah from the very beginning. We miss the point because we think it's about this one dude who's removed from us in context, and we just don't really know what to do with it. But I'm telling you, we are far more like him than we want to admit. Yeah? Are y'all tracking with verses 1 through 3? All right. Questions, comments, concerns. All right. Then let us look at verses 4 through 6. Let me read that again. So God has let Jonah run. He's let him get to Joppa. He's let him buy a ticket. He's let him go in the boat, and he's let him go to sleep. Verse 4. But then the Lord acts. The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. And the mariners, the sailors, were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. And so the captain came and said to him, What are you doing? What do you mean, sleeper? Get up. Arise, call out to your God, and perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. How many of y'all have in your translation of verse 4 that God sent a great wind or a, a storm? Sent? Okay, I'm not bashing on the word, but that ain't what the word means. That word does not mean send, it is far stronger than that. He doesn't just send something, he hurls it. That word is tool. Tool means to hurl or to throw. In fact, you see that exact same word with what the sailors do with the cargo. Do you think the sailors sent the cargo over the edge gently? No, nah, man, they were chunking that junk, man. We've got to get it out of here now. Every bit of it, go. Get it out. We see them doing that a little bit later on, and you know what they do with Jonah eventually? They send him into the water, right? Did they send him or did they throw that dude? They threw that joker, right? They throw him into the sea. So here's my point. Like, this is not some, like, docile thing. In fact, you'll see the ESV translates it as tempestuous multiple times in verses 6 through, uh, I'm sorry, 7 through 17, that the sea is getting more and more tempestuous. It is getting riled up. This is not something that just happened. God is acting definitively. Are you tracking with that? Okay. So here's the deal. When you think of how this storm was going down, describe it to me. In your, in your best imagination, how far from the port of Joppa were they? What kind of water does this look like? Is it night? Is it day? You tell me. Like, no right or wrong answers necessarily. I just want to hear what you think. What do you have in your mind brain when you think about this storm? What's going on? You got these salty dogs on the ship and what? Somebody over oh, the page. They're in the middle of the ocean. Can't see anything around them, okay? Night, okay, yeah. Terrifying, okay? Yeah, remember, these are the Phoenician cats. 
who are all the way going to Tarshish, guys, it ain't just around the corner. Like, these dudes are some salty dogs, man. They know what's up. And what are these dudes doing? Man, they are flipping their wig. How do traders make their money? The junk they're throwing overboard, right? How big a deal is this? Here's the thing I want us to see. God is absolutely threatening to wreck this ship and probably others just to get to Jonah. Here's my point. If this is a supernatural storm, which is what they accredit it to, right? The mariners, the sailors, what do they start doing? They just start battening down the hatches and saying, oh, we'll be good. No, no, no. What do they start doing? They start tossing stuff overboard and what else? They start praying. Hey, man, whatever God you got, start praying to that dude because hopefully we can make it out alive because of this. They attribute this to some supernatural thing. In your mind, even if it is in the middle of the sea, whatever, does it, is it like a storm that just kind of follows this boat? Is that what you have in your mind? Because I think for a time, that's kind of what I thought. I don't think that's what's going on. Like, this is a huge storm. It wouldn't be all that impressive if it was just, like, localized. Like, I get it. It might have its own kind of novelty, but, like, that's not how waves work. You ever thought about that? Localized storms don't produce those kinds of waves where it's literally going to break the ship up. And what we'll see in the next section is these guys, they try to strap everything down. They throw stuff overboard. They start rowing hard to get to the edge, get to the coast. And so no matter how far off they are, like, these guys are losing their wits. But here's the deal. God thought it was prudent to, to do such violence in the sea, even if it meant that ship and others were threatened. And even if I'm wrong, let's say I'm wrong. Okay, it wasn't multiple ships. Who else is threatened by Jonah's disobedience? Every dude on that boat. You see how Jonah's disobedience is bringing about more disastrous results for himself and others? I think this is really important because the deal is the sailor's fear is real. However, we'll just peek ahead over into verse 10 and then later in verse 16 and 17. These cats, their fear is actually just starting. It's going to get worse. Once they find out that this dude is a Hebrew and he's a prophet and he serves the Lord, great. Oh, but I'm running from him. What? What do you mean you're running from him? And then their fear is exceedingly great. Like, it's bad now and it's going to get worse because of Jonah's disobedience, because of his rebellion right? And here's the other thing that I want us to see. The sailors are the ones who are arising when Jonah's asleep. Are you catching that? That huge contrast? Jonah was told in verse 2, arise, go to Nineveh, and call out to the city. And what does the captain say? Actually, I didn't change it. It's not 1-1, it's 1-2. In chapter 1, verse 6, the captain comes down there and kicks this dude's hammock or whatever he's asleep in and goes, dude, what are you doing? You got to get up, man. We, you got to call out to whatever God you serve. Arise and call out to your God. Do you not see the irony of this? Jonah could have done anything to help. In the text, does Jonah pray in this section? So how are we supposed to handle this? Let me ask this question first, then we'll get to our application. Why do you think Jonah was in such deep sleep? Why do you think? It's an odd question, but I think there's value to it. Mary Kate. Okay, so he's in a deep sleep because God caused it. Let's put it that way, right? Is there evidence in the Old Testament of God causing a deep sleep? Yeah, that happens all the time. Well, not all the time. It happens frequently enough to say that's possible. Adam gets put to sleep and you know, puts under with anesthetics or whatever, not anesthetic, anesthesia. Yeah, same thing. I'm looking at my nurse and doctor in the area. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, get put to sleep and gets a rib removed, right? There's different characters from the Old Testament who have these crazy dreams when they're asleep, and it seems like a really deep sleep. I think there's something to that. What's another explanation? Why else Jonah 
why else might Jonah be dead asleep here? He was comfortable in what he was doing. He thought he had won out. And what is it that he had done? I got nothing to worry about. Pulled one over on the old man. He'll never know. And I think, practically, if he was up in Samaria, which makes sense that that's where he would be in the town of Samaria, because that's where Jeroboam was, because he's the prophet speaking to a king, makes sense that he would have been there. Plus, if not that, he's a little further north in Gath Affair, right? Like he's up there near Galilee. Maybe homeboy was just exhausted, right? Homeboy was high-telling it to Joppa. He finally gets there, and what is he going to do the first instance he gets to sleep? Dude just racks out, right? Here's, here's the point. Whether it was God causing it, whether it was him thinking he got one over on God, whether it was him exhausted, here's what I know the result is, and this is what you need to write down. This is the application here. We cannot be effective witnesses for God if you're in rebellion. Because whether or not it was God causing the sleep, whether it was not he thought he had got one over on the old man, whether or not it was he was just exhausted, what do we know he was not doing? He wasn't praying. He could have stopped all this. He wasn't arising. Homeboy was conked out down below, right? And you just got to have in your mind, like all these sailors are just frantically throwing everything they can over the ship uh, sides, and then they go downstairs into the hold, and they're grabbing more junk to throw, and there's a dude conked out in the corner, I'd be kicking that dude right in the leg, like, get up, homie. We're about to die. Like, you better start praying. There is incredibly careful attention paid in, in Jonah. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 5, verse 14, 2, 1 and 2, chapter 3, verse 8, and chapter 4, verse 2, at least one explicit reference in every chapter is to prayer being offered. And what does Jonah not do here? Pray. So the question is, why did he not pray? Why didn't he pray? It's embarrassing to have to confess what? Mm -hmm. And eventually, what we're going to see in verse 7, like, okay, all the sailors, they finally get on deck and they start drawing lots and the lot falls to Jonah, and they're like, dude, what'd you do? Oh, by the way, I'm on the run from the Lord. And they're like, what? What? Are you serious? Like, you're, you're running from the Lord. And so he finally comes clean, but, like, that's after he, you know, in their world, he has no other options. Like, everybody knows something's up with this dude, right? Why else isn't Jonah praying? So he's embarrassed. What else? He's already trying to get away from that dude. You think I'm going to go pray to him? I'm trying to flee from God. You think I'm going to pray to him right now? And this is why I'm saying, if we are in rebellion, you cannot be an effective witness because the very thing you need the most is this anchor, this lifeline of prayer, and he ain't going to do it. Those requests for being saved and rescued from this situation, they are impossible for someone who is in this kind of rebellion until repentance takes place. Not only was Jonah in major peril, who else was in major peril? These sailors at a minimum, and however many other ships were in this same storm. And to Jonah, it didn't matter. Yeah? And we're going to see it doesn't matter so much that eventually they throw him overboard, and he's like, okay, well, this will work. And he still doesn't escape. I mean, there's still two more chapters of junk after that. Three more, really. Yeah? Yeah? Are you tracking with why this is such a big deal and how we might actually miss the content of Jonah and like what the point of it is? Cool. Give me a north south. All right. So, Rich. Jonah was so desperate he didn't care that he died. In fact, we know that's true. Because in chapter four, he's like, yeah, just kill me now, man. He goes up on the hill to see if God's actually going to rescue these folks or if he's going to burn them alive. And he's waiting for a show, and it doesn't happen. And then God confronts him, and he's like, this is, this is what I told you. This is why I didn't want to come here. Just, just kill me. 
That's what Jonah says. Yeah? All right, so here's what I want to do. I want to return back to our main idea. Jonah's disobedience brought about disastrous results for himself and others, and it's the same thing for us. Here's the thing. When you think of these disastrous results, what comes to your mind for, th for this text in 1 through 6? What are the disastrous results? Financial loss, yeah. All that stuff is gone. What happens to the ship if this thing keeps going the way it is? Ship's going to be destroyed, right? What else? These dudes are going to die. They're going to drown. In fact, they're, and we're going to talk about this a little bit in two weeks, like there's a good argument that Jonah actually died, that there's actually a, a, a resurrection given to Jonah after those three days, which is why Jesus references it's not 100% clear, but like him going down into the earth, there's an argument that Jonah actually dies and that God, when he gets spit up on the shore, he raises him back up. Either way, either way, it doesn't really matter because the point is like they're going to die if this ship breaks up. Then what are you going to do? Hang on to some flotsam and jetsam and hope for the best? You're probably going to die. I better listen. A man who was out of fellowship with God refused to confess his sin and repent and be restored. Somebody take that a step further for me. What happens to those sailors if they die? Brennan? This prophet, who has the very words of God, who has experienced God's grace, who has experienced ministerial success, has the keys to their eternal life and says, I'd just rather not. Guys, we have the same opportunity in front of us. Whenever we read Jonah, a lot of times what we look at is Ah, there's the boat, there's the loss of life, there's the loss of financial items, you know, things that are this stuff. And like, yeah, every bit of that's true, but what's the more important thing that is going to be lost when these dudes die? And who is right there that could tell them what they need to know? These cats are pagan. Hey, man, tell us who you are, what country you come from. Hey, man, I'm a Hebrew and I serve the Lord. <laughs> what? And after they toss this cat overboard, you know what those sailors end up doing? Just real quick, turn with me to the end of the chapter. Verse 15, they finally get to their wits' end. They picked up Jonah and they sent him into the sea. Is that what yours says? Yeah. Man, they threw that joker. Man, they tossed him. They tooled him, right? They threw him into the sea, and what happened? Well, that comes later, but what happens to the sea? It stops raging. And then verse 16, what do these cats do? Hey, man, that dude, whatever was going on with him, whatever God he serves, that's the right one. It took what was possibly Jonah's death, if that's chapter 2, is, if that's the correct interpretation. If not, it took him going overboard and a fish sustaining him for three days underwater, miraculous in and of itself. It took that. And then they offered sacrifices. Or perhaps what could they have done? They could have offered those exact same sacrifices if what? If Jonah had told them, hey, this is how you actually serve God. If he had repented. If he had been restored to fellowship. You cannot be a witness for God when you are actively rebelling against him. It doesn't work. So let me just pause right there. Do y'all think that maybe Jonah has a different message than what you've kind of come to have in your mind about what Jonah's actually about just from tonight? Because here's the thing. I think it actually gets worse from here. I think we miss so much from Jonah that we just substitute this cheap cartoonish substitution of Jonah that we miss everything that Jonah's about. You tracking with me there? All right. Let me give you some final thoughts. Let me be clear. That... The disastrous results are not just the ship 
and people dying. The disastrous results are people being separated from Christ, separated from God's love for eternity. That's the disastrous results. Yeah? Because here's the deal. Jonah is all of us, y'all. <laughs> the same reasons that Jonah was fleeing and being disobedient, I think we do the same things. What is something that we as Christians are disobedient to do? Come now. You know, what I'm, you know the answer. Just say it out loud. What is it we're commanded to do by Jesus? Tell others. When it comes to the Great Commission, there is either adherence to or disobedience of. Period. There is no third option. And when it comes to making disciples, it is impossible to do that if you're not being one yourself. Jonah is all of us. Here's the next thing. As quickly as we want God to come rescue us, that's how quickly we should be obeying God. But what we see from Jonah is the moment that he saw his chance of like, oh, I'm called to do this, and he immediately and runs the other direction, it leads to disaster. So as quickly as we want God to come and have influence in our life, that should be how quickly we respond in obedience to the Lord. And just real quickly, how many of y'all are doing great in that department? Because I'm not that great at it. Let me just be clear, like, I'm not. I think I'm pretty good at being obedient a lot of times. But man, what about those other ones? You think that kind of disobedience is just, eh, not a big deal? Because here's the deal. Rebellion does invite God's wrath. Make no mistake about it. God is going to get your attention one way or another, right? He is going to get your attention. And if this rejection of God's grace is what your life is marked by, then yes, it is inviting wrath from God because you've rejected the one place where there is grace and mercy and forgiveness. What else is left for you then? Because here's the deal. God will wreck your ship to get your attention. He'll wreck it. I don't know what your ship is. Maybe it's your, <clears throat> your house. Maybe it's your financial status. Maybe it is your job. Maybe it is your reputation. Maybe it is whatever. Make no mistake, God will wreck that to get your attention. He will. And here's the last thing. If we reject God's purposes for us, we're rejecting the best purposes possible for us. Hey, Jonah. I need you to go to Nineveh. Yeah, God, I really don't want to. Yeah, I know you don't, but this is what is best. It's best because this is what I'm telling you needs to happen, and you don't understand it, but there is this whole city that is going to be restored to me. In fact, in about 800 years, my son's going to come, and he's going to say, actually, Nineveh repented in the right way, and they're going to judge this people, and I need you to go. And I'm going to bless you. It's going to be rough. It's going to be hard. It's going to suck. I'm telling you, yeah, that's going to happen but I'm going to be enough. But when we reject that purpose that God has given us, you are going to settle for something that is lesser, period. There, there's not another purpose that God has for you that supersedes how great that is that also comes with you being disobedient. You seeing that? Those two things go hand in hand. Yeah? All right. Page. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I would say that we have to be very clear in not uh, attributing to God's sin because the Bible never does so. In James chapter 1, James says, Let none of us say that God is tempting me because God cannot be tempted with evil and he doesn't tempt anyone with evil. So we cannot say that God uh, causes sin. Now, this is where you get into that weird situation of like, does God permit sin? Certainly. Does God lessen its effects? Yeah. Does God allow it in all sorts of ways? Yeah, absolutely. But he doesn't cause it, right? And so we're seeing that tension. But here's the thing that I would say when it comes to God will wreck your ship to get your attention. I think a lot of times what we consider God's judgment is that there's like this one thunderous act and that there's obviously God's acting in that. You go read Romans chapter 1, and you know what God does to judge people who are in their sin? He says, please stop. Please stop. 
This is not the way I want you to go. Please don't do that. And it'll get to a point where God says, okay, you can have what you wanted. And he passively just lets you go after what you want. So here's my point. I don't think that God in this one thunderous act, him judging, is the only way that he brings about judgment. There are plenty of ways where he just actively uh, is judging, yes, but there are other times where he just passively takes his hands off and says, okay, these are the consequences that I've already told you will come from disobedience, and he lets you have it. He gives them over is the phrase that Paul uses in Romans 1, over and over. Yeah, so I, I hear your point, Paige. There is something to philosophically, like, how does that work? How does God use that suffering? Yeah, absolutely. But if we think that God doesn't use suffering and wickedness to his ends, then I would say you're going to have a heck of a time dealing with the cross. Yeah? If we say that God cannot use wickedness and sin for his purposes then there is no salvation for us. That's what you now have to conclude because Jesus had done nothing wrong, had been sinless, and yet was crucified. And that was according to God's plan. I don't know how to reconcile every bit of that philosophically and intellectually, but I do think that there is something too that like, yeah, that's how this operates. And I think that's part of the story of Jonah that we're invited to wrestle with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You certainly had done something wrong, Job. What was it? Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Nope. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. No, no, no. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so you're, even with your hand motions, you're like, you're stretching for like, they seem to go together, but they are apart. That's what we call tension. Welcome to the Bible. This is why we need the wisdom literature, because here's the deal. Let me just explain it really quickly. Proverbs will tell you this is how you're supposed to live, right? Like, this is what is best. Ecclesiastes comes along and says, yeah, but there's all sorts of exceptions. I've seen this guy who's super wicked, and he had all sorts of money, and he lived to 100. Had a great life. And we're like, well, how do those two work? Do you know what the Bible also tells us? Hey, here's Job that lives out that tension of this is how life is supposed to be lived, which Job does, and yet he suffers. And so that's where God is inviting us into this tension of this is what it means to live in a fallen and broken world, and you desperately need him. And so the invitation is to rely on him and seek wisdom. Literally, wisdom literature is teaching us how to live a life that is well lived under God's purposes and his designs. But in a fallen world, it's going to be jacked up. And so that tension you're experiencing, welcome. That's the air we breathe, yeah? And I'm not at all claiming to have the answers, but what I am saying is good observation, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the deal. For the, for the rest of your life, it's going to be working out that tension, and just like Jonah, you're going to be offered an opportunity to trust in God. Or you can run. You can run. You can try. You can try to pull one over on the old man, but it probably ain't going to work, right? All right, we've already gone over. Any other comments or questions? A lot. Well, hey, here's the good news. I'll be hanging around. Here are some questions you might want to consider. If nothing else, I just want to draw your attention to that third one. How might you be sleeping while your ship is breaking up? I don't know what the ship is. I don't know how you might be sleeping. But what is that in your life? Because I think that's the invitation here. For all the philosophical and intellectual questions you're bringing up, Paige, great. Like, let's, let's work through that as best we can. Here's what I also know. There might be something you're sleeping through right now that you need to be woken up right now. And I'm telling you, there's an opportunity for that to happen today. If you need to have a conversation about what it looks like to repent, what it means to work through some of these things, I'm right here. I want to have this conversation with you. If you miss some of the notes, come up here. I'll get you taken care of. If not, check it out online. It's going to be on our website. It's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on Spotify. We'll get you taken care of, yeah? Cool? All right. Here's the last thing. That's where we're going next week. We're looking at the rest of chapter 1, 7 through 17. Same time, same place. It's all going to be right in here. If you are a parent, you need to go get your kids from Mission Journey Kids. Um, youth will be wrapping up here in about 25, 30 minutes. So just hang around. Um, but the band is going to be doing rehearsal here in a bit, so... Don't linger too long. They, they got work to do in here. Yeah? Cool? 
All right, let me pray for us, and then we will be dismissed. Father, I thank you for the story of Jonah. I thank you for the account of somebody whom I believe was a real man that had real foibles, but also had real obedience. And God, I pray that we would be like the Jonah of 2 Kings and not like the Jonah of Jonah chapter 1. God, I pray that whatever it is in our lives that you are trying to communicate to us and how we are to repent and what is going on and how you're wrecking our ship, God, I pray that we would come to a point where we are repentant, we confess those sins to one another, we confess them to you ultimately, and that we would seek forgiveness. And Father, I pray that if there's anybody who needs to have a conversation about what that looks like, they'd come find me. Um, And if not, I trust that your spirit is exceedingly able to deal with whatever problems we are having. So Lord, right now I just confess that we need you and that we love you. And we pray all this in your son's name. Amen.